Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we are going to revisit the topic of affirmations. My guest is Daryl Robert Schoon, with whom I had a previous conversation some months ago about affirmations. We're going to take it a little deeper today. Daryl is a minister in the Temple of Universality, a spiritualist church located in Tucson, Arizona. He is author of a number of books, including you can't always get what you want. Light in a dark place. The time of the vulture. Report to the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Is God confused? And the way to heaven. Welcome, Daryl. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, to add to that litany <coughs> of things that I do, someday we could add, um, Part co-owner of Mr. Happy Sack Condom Company, right, which yeah. Martha and I own. Mm. And we are partners in WWW Bioactive C60, which was inspired by Bucky Fuller. So that's, that's way too long to add to the thing. But I just right. wanted to put that out for you. And thank you for the introduction. You're very welcome. So we talked about affirmations earlier. It was uh, a lengthy interview. I'm going to link to it okay. on the upper right hand side of the screen because some viewers, I know we're going to reiterate parts of what we spoke about, but some viewers uh, might wish to watch that okay. first or at least have it as a reference. Good. But uh, as we get deeper into affirmations, I, I think one of the questions that really interests me is, why should they work at all? And why is it that they sometimes don't work? People who, who come to me, you know, because affirmations are part of what you might think of as the new thought movement. And some people will say, well, if affirmations work so well, how, how come six million Jews got slaughtered? What happened to them? Didn't they have affirmations? Dr. Mishlove, I'm using that term because that is an elevated question. You really, that, that's interesting that you bring up that huh. as a background of thought. Why do they work sometimes? Because, uh, you know, I run into people and they go, well, they never work for me. Okay. Yeah. And I have played around with this for, since 19, 1973. Mm. Thought. And the effect of thought. Well, let's dial it back because something very significant happened um, after our last conversation on October 31st. Um, I ran, I, I, I read, I have a lot of books in my disposal and I don't remember them. And I began rereading a book that I had started before. Okay. Didn't catch my attention, not because of the subject matter, I think because the time wasn't right. And it's a book called Unveiled Mysteries. Okay, and it was a story by, by Guy Ballard or Godfrey Ray King, mm -hmm. and it's part of the I Am series, yeah. where he has a conversation with the Ascended Master, St. Germain. I visited their uh, headquarters uh, at Mount Shasta on one occasion. Here we go. Yeah. And the topic is, why do they work or not work? Yeah. All right? Now, that question, I think, was addressed specifically in a book that I had read in 1981, all right? Here I had used what it became known as affirmations before they were known because of Joe Carbo's book, The Lazy Man's Raider Witches. Yep. And like I said, Joe Carbo's book was probably had the best explanation of what was going to become known as affirmations. Marshall and I both did this in 1973, 74, 75. And by seven, my friend Marshall my friend Thurber. from law school, yeah. all right, who had introduced me to Joe Carbo's book who later introduced me to the, because of him, The Course in Miracles and The Power of Now. Mm -hmm. So let us not, I want to acknowledge Marshall in his, and be my filter or my feed for certain significant books in my life. Mm -hmm. The first book was totally, had nothing to do with metaphysics, nothing to do with consciousness, The Lazy Man's Way to Riches. However, after working with this for a couple of years, Martha and I, Marshall and I both became wealthy. And I never saw Marshall's list. 
He never saw mine. But three years after we started, it, he's living in a mansion next to Diane Feinstein with a Rolls Royce, a Corvette, a series of cars. And I am more than comfortably retired as a hippie with a lot of cash living on Union Street. Well, now you talk about a list. What you do is, Joe Carbo said, I don't know why this works. Joe Carbo was a used car salesman, all right? And he said he was in desperate straits, and he wrote down. This is what's incredible. He said, you have to, he said, he, you, like Napoleon Hill, you have to know what you want. So, Joe Carbo refined it even further to three lists. The first list, what are your present needs? I need dental work. Okay, let's say. Your second list, how do you want your life to be? I would like to have abundance, perfect health, and a life of ease. That would go on the second list under Joe's categories. Mm -hmm. The third list, how would you like to be? Under that, my go, I want to be one with God. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't on my list then. It's on my list now. Yeah. All right? In fact, not only is it, it doesn't even have to be on my list because I already know I am one with God. On my list should be, I want conscious co creation and communication with God. So so let me review that the first list according to Joe Carbo's the lazy man's way, way to riches way to riches is just your immediate needs. needs. The second list is how you would want your life to be in its ideal state. Uh -huh. And he pointed out this can change all the time. Yeah. These are not these are at the moment. Okay? And the third list is how you want to be, mm. your personal self. So on that yeah. third list would be, I would like to be in a constant state of communication with the creator. Okay. So three lists. Okay. And then Joe said, go through your list and see if there's any conflict between a goal on one list and a goal on another. He wants your list to be congruent. Mm -hmm. Then he said, put them down on three by five cards. And then he said, before you go to bed, and when you wake up, read your card and imagine it being happening right now. Okay? How do you imagine it? Were there special techniques? You use your imagination. And, for example, you say, um, my dental work, in, I need my dental work done. You would look at your card and imagine yourself, your dental work completed, you're happy, your teeth don't hurt. That root canal that's sitting there driving you up the wall is gone. Okay. And you're happy. So that's what you do on the on. The, in, other, in other words, your the visualization includes an element of feeling tone. Absolutely perfect. Okay, and then Joe said, "I don't know why you have to do it this way, but this is what it is. I became a millionaire. I'm handing it on to you yeah. for ten dollars money back guarantee at seventy three. Well, it you know it sounds like magic, and and in fact, it's exactly uh, magic in in a way. So the question is, why and how sh should it work? It worked for you. It did, and I love the fact that you brought it back to magic because what it does, it gives a, a sense of legitimacy to an area that we think is spooky. Is and by the very word magic is is it isn't real in our present cultural zeitgeist. Yeah. I believe in your world, it is real. Well, the word magic, to my understanding, can be traced back to the teachings of Zoroaster and and the Magi. The three wise Very. men who, who came to uh, the uh, Bethlehem uh, for the birth of Jesus, who followed the stars. Jeffrey, I should talk to you more often. It would make me feel less bizarre. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you try. He, absolutely. And it is. An ancient science. An ancient science. Okay. Yeah. Here, how a used car dealer came up with this, no one knows. But Marshall and I did it, and we got everything we wanted. No. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what Martin, but we were. But now I know from our conversations, you do have some ideas as to how it works. Yes. Why it works. Why it works. And why it doesn't. And why it doesn't work. Okay. Work. Yeah. And I think the, those reasons came to me after I stopped my affirmations because I erroneously believed that if I let go of, <laughs> could let go of, if I could turn tomorrow over, he who wants my happiness, for it is his happiness also, every moment would become an encounter with the eternal. Direct code from the Course of Miracles. Mm -hmm. Because of my success with the affirmations, it came to me in words in my head that what I had wasn't it. So I asked, according to Michael Tom's thing on the Knowing Seminar, what do I want? This feeling of deep peace came in in 1976. So I started writing down peace on all my affirmations. Within three months, The Course of Miracles comes into my life via Marshall's group. And the foreword to The Course of Miracles is, 
This is the manual for peace. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is up to you. So almost on command or on time, it came to me. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading The Course in Miracles, and I misinterpret one of its statements, as I am inclined to do with much of my life. Well, I suppose everybody is, because a statement is just words, and, and words can always be uh, interpreted differently than they were intended. Thank you, Dr. Mishlove. I don't go see psychiatrists or psychologists, and yet I realize that the universe has given you to me to <laughs> help me feel better about what I've done and not done with my life. <laughs> All right. Okay, you're right. I interpreted it away. In retrospect, I went back and read the fine words and said, if you could but turn tomorrow over to he. I did what I could was just let go, and I lost every penny I had and was sunk into owing a quarter million dollars mm -hmm. two years later. Yeah. Well, the universe, I'm on a feed. And and like I said, we got back into the affirmations because we're we're at the we were my first wife and I, we had no, I had blown it. I, I would now, rather than having everything I wanted, I had nothing. And we're looking for a rental in Marin County and on the back, which is the most expensive county in the world. I'm down to a couple grand in cash. All right. Because I'm living at her uncle's house. All right. This is how our straits are. And we're looking for a rental. And on the back page of the independent journal, which had all the rentals in Marin County was a full page ad for Joe Carbo's lazy man's way to riches. This is in 1981. Mm -hmm. And she goes, don't you think we ought to do this again? It worked once. We did it again. <laughs> the next year, we are staying at a suite at the Hassler Hotel in Rome. B on, on three of her, Bambi had written down three things that she wanted. Travel again, go to China, Europe, and Tahiti. Everyone came true. The only difference is, you used affirmations. Mm -hmm. So, you've established now on two occasions that they work with precision. Yeah. For you. For me. Very good. Very good. And I had a little bit of guilt because I had picked up affirmations again, my control mechanism. The guilt was assuaged when I ran across the book in Marin County called How to Do All Things, Your Guide to the Use of Divine Power. Which was a which was a book from the Mark Age group. I had never run into it before, but they talked about why these affirmations work. Mm -hmm. Which is your question? Mm -hmm. And they said, when you are using thought and words, you are using cosmic power. All right, and you, as a part of God, have access to this power. It raises the most fundamental question of all: What is a thought? This is their explanation or their re response. To that. We Very take good. thoughts for granted. granted. We're, we're swimming in, in thoughts. thoughts. But do we ever ask ourselves, what is a thought? Okay. Very good question, Dr. Mishler. Okay. This is my answer at this point in time and space. Thoughts are anything that we generate and they come through us and we see them in our mind. Most of our thoughts are mundane irrelevant, judgmental, and rather insane because they reflect our experience here. I entered quite unexpectedly the what they call no thinking for the first time in my life when I took LSD. LSD thought turned off your thought-generating machine. For those who have imbibed at the fountain of psychedelics, you don't think. You just are. You just are. And you're in the presence of art of beingness. You're not thinking. You're not. You're no longer going. Okay. And you only know that because you're in a totally different reality. LSD turns off what I call the subtitling machine, which is the font of thinking in our reality. Subtitles are what I call the words that explain your experience. Everyone has a different subtitling machine. Gender, race personality explain your subtitles and everybody else's subtitles. Everybody. Everybody has a subtitle machine which personally reflects their own judgments, beliefs, perceptions, it. All right? And they manifest as thoughts. Okay? So, 
without getting to what thought is, this is a reflection on what thought does in, in an operation. Okay, do you see I'm backing into your question. I'm yep. trying to get there. I get it. Okay, you're real. I, mean, I didn't think I was going to have to address that question <laughs> until you did. All right. So I'm backing into it in an operational way that we experience thoughts in that way as our subtitle machine that tells us about life. Yep. Now, what it tells us, each one of us, is individualized. You are getting a different explanation of reality than I am. Republicans go for a different explanation as liberal Democrats, as agnostics, as atheists, as Buddhists, as we all have our own thought projections, which is still not the question of what is thought. Okay? But we're getting closer. But you, we are getting closer. Thank you. Now, we have now, I think, established the thing that thoughts are powerful or they have a power. Because what Marshall and I did with, our, with Joe Carbo's book is basically create reality. Create a tangible experience in what we call the world. All right? I went from absolutely not broke to basically going, well, you know, what I maybe should do is take up tennis lessons because to heal my relationship with my father, who was a tennis junkie. I went to a life of ease, very with this use of thought. You, okay. you went from not broke to a life of ease? Or? I went from absolutely broke to, to a life of ease. Okay. Through the use of thought. Yes. Of conscious use of thought. Right. All right. Then, so, he's exemplifying the new age adage that some people love and some people hate. You create your own reality. Every thought has consequence. Yeah. Every, that's one of the fundaments of it. Mm -hmm. Every thought has a latent power in it. Okay. The ability to go from the invisible world to the visible. Because thought is invisible. Thought is a part of... Oh, very good. Don Juan, the Yaqui shaman, told Carlos Castaneda, there are two worlds. The world of the Tonal. Okay? And this is the world of objective manifestation. It's the world of things. It's the world that we share. We, we all live in a world of things, and we share the same touchstones in that world. In our world of things, Donald Trump is a president. Putin is over in Russia. Xi is over in China. All right, we have major religions. We, we share um, the same. It appears solid to us. Yes. Now, which goes to another thought. The first lesson in The Course in Miracles is this. You let your eyes just go and rest on something. Let's say I see a chair. And I say in lesson number one of the Course in Miracles, or two or three, that chair has no meaning. That body has no meaning. That life has no meaning. So what the Course in Miracles does with the tonal is to establish that whatever you're seeing in the tonal has no intrinsic meaning. The second lesson in the Course in Miracles is Whatever meaning that chair has, I have given it. Whatever meaning that body that I call Jeffrey Mislove, I have given it. Whatever meaning that light screen has, I have given it. So the Course of Miracles deconstructs my subtitle machine. It deconstructs the world of the tonal at a level we don't do. It goes back to basics. It goes back to saying every object that exists in the world of, the, of what we call objective reality, take a note here, all you objectivists, there's a little bitterness, okay? That it's purely a judgment that we have given it, that the, the objective world itself has no real meaning, which is a reality, quote unquote, that quantum physics is now dealing with. It just is. It just is, mm -hmm. all right? But we don't, we can't live in just is. We just project on it because it's our control mechanism. Meaning comes from what, what it, it, Castaneda's Don Juan would call the Nagual. The Nag. No. Yes. Real meaning comes from the Nagual. But the temporary meaning comes from our own personalities, projections of judgments, beliefs. So, in other words, if, if I'm hearing you right, you're, you're establishing three categories, the tonal, the nagual, and something that you're calling our personal consciousness. Very good, Dr. Mishnah. 
<laughs> I'm looking for help. There's a reason why you have this channel. Okay. That's excellent. You're right. There is the Nagual, or what the I Ching calls the void. Oh, no. What the I Ching calls the non-changing. That's the Nagual. Okay? And what other disciplines or thought systems call the void. That from which the manifested world comes from. Okay? Well, the ground of the being. The ground of being. Very good. The, the ground of eternal being. reality. The eternal reality. The uh -huh. non-changing. Okay. The changing is the tonal. The world, the only world that we think is real mm -hmm. in the present limited zeitgeist. And everyone has a different version of this and a different meaning of it and sees it differently because of what you pointed out is the third thing, our own personal perception of the tonal. Mm -hmm. Because we do not perceive the nagual. The nagual does not exist as an element of our perception. The nagual exists as a backdrop to it but we don't perceive it. We experience it. Everything else we perceive. That's the world of the tonal. And each one of us has a separate experience of the tonal because we all have different perceptions, judgments, and beliefs. Okay. Which come from the power of us as creators. Each one of us is creating our own reality through the thoughts that we have and projecting. Thank you. Well, we we're we're getting a little closer oh, now to, to the to the magic that seems to be inherent in thoughts because if thoughts are just personal things generated by our personality, so what? Yes. Except though they may be ephemeral, they're consequential. Extraordinarily consequential. Though they may be purely illusory and rooted in personal prejudice, judgment, rage, fear, terror, and, f and loneliness, they are consequential. Because thoughts have a power under themselves to create a reality and an experience. Okay? Well, I would understand that for, from where we are in our conversation personally. Like, my thoughts are going to affect my judgments and my actions. But my thoughts ought not to, at this point in the conversation, extend out into the world to, you know, bring wealth uh, to me. You're right. You're <clears throat> absolutely right. Because, and this, now, so what I had done in my own personal journey, I, I'd, I had used thought in a way because of Joe Carver's book and created what I wanted. Yeah. Then, because of my own personal journey, I hear these words, this isn't it. And I asked the question, what is it? And peace was the answer I got. So I started adding peace to all my affirmations. I encountered the Course in Miracles, and I misinterpreted one of the lines that said, if you could but turn tomorrow over, as you said, there's no mistakes. And this is all interpretation anyway, correct or incorrect, which is a judgment. I let go of all my control mechanisms and lost every penny I had and went a quarter million dollars in debt. All right. Then on the back page of the Independent Journal is an ad for Joe Carbo's book. <laughs> Basically, nine years, seven years later, we do it again, and it all comes back. So there I am, once again living. We're going. Life is good. And I run into a book called um, uh, "How to Do All Things." You're used to the your guide to the use of divine power, and what this book said is this. You can do nothing of yourself. However, all things are done for you. And they explain it with this metaphor. You decide to go across the room and, and open the door. How do you do it? A thought comes into your mind. I want to open that door. And how does it happen? Your body picks you up, takes you over, and opens the door. What did you do with it? All you had was a thought. You think you got your... No, your body did it automatically. All right? But the thought <laughs> caused the, the, con the chain of events to the desired result of opening the door. And what the book explained was this. That mechanism is spirit, is God. That mechanism is creation. That mechanism is how the universe stays in manifestation and disappears from manifestation and changes in manifestation. And it said, basically, you have access to that power because of who you 
are, who each one of us is, but our access to that power is limited based on our spiritual development. Because if we were given the whole kit and caboodle, we would not only screw up our lives, we'd screw this. In, in other words, you're saying, or this book is saying, I think you mentioned earlier it's by Mark Age. The Mark Age publication. Mark Age you, publication. How to do all things. How to do all things. That A simple act that we all take for granted every day, getting out of the chair, opening a door, is only occurs because of divine power. Yes. Absolutely. Most of us never think of it that yeah, way. But they, they did. That's yes, what it says. Yes. And it says, this is the power to everything. There's only one power in the universe, divine power. And because of who we are, whatever we want, we have access to the power. Now, let's define that. Because this is something we talked about in one of our conversations previously, where the Course in Miracles said, because of who you are, if you truly ask to be happy, you would be. Another thought that we said, how is that true? We all want to be happy. But what the, the Course of Miracles said, if you ever truly asked to be happy, you would be happy. What it's implying is we have never truly asked to be happy with what it really means. We just want to be happy. We haven't asked to be happy. Okay? Asking sets the thought and request in motion. Wanting to be happy is just sort of an undefined state that I'm not happy. I'd rather be happy. Okay, it's diffuse. It's oh. it's thought that's just floating around. That's not really focused. Okay, now my philosophy is a little different. Okay, my philosophy is if you commit to be happy, you'll be happy. That's same thing because you're focusing the commitment. Commitment is a word for focus. Uh -huh. Powerful. That's it. If you commit. And what the Course of Miracles said, if you had ever really truly committed, you would be. Yeah. Okay? Now, I read those words, and I, I told in a previous story, in uh, 1978, I'm about to go into China, and I'm reading the Course of Miracles, and it says that, and I go, that's not true. But then it says, I knew I'd never, it says, perhaps you should ask why you haven't truly asked or committed to being happy in your terms. Mm -hmm. So, I closed the book, I closed my eyes, I'm in the Intercontinental Hotel in Japan in Tokyo, and I go... Why haven't I asked or committed to be happy? The answer was immediate. You're afraid of dying. And I knew it was my ego. My ego. My ego was afraid that if I really committed and asked to be happy, it would, I wouldn't exist. Wow. I had a fear in me that was keeping me from truly being happy that I was unaware of until I asked the question. All right? Now, I'm under the impression, Daryl, because you discussed LSD a little earlier, and I've had some experience with LSD. That's magic, boy. That it's, it's a process. You don't automatically let go of all your thinking right away. A, a trip has stages, and one of those stages is confronting that fear of ego death. And, yes. and, and thoughts, you're, you're, you know, you're struggling with it, and then at some point you let go and then you enter into this state, which is is very akin to a state of pure enlightenment. Oh, money, money. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishla, for your edification of what we're talking about. You're right. <clears throat> it doesn't happen all at once. And my one of my statements about time is, time is the element for the miracle of life to take place. Time is the element that's necessary for the miracle of life to express itself on the three-dimensional plane. All right? Without time, it doesn't have time to express <laughs> itself. <laughs> okay? It just is. It just is. Yeah. But in three-dimensional creative reality, a, a duality, time is necessary for the, for the expression of creation to express itself fully on the physical plane. As we're doing at this moment. As we're doing at this moment. Boy, we're pretty current, <laughs> my feeling is. All right? More current than I thought we were going to get to this morning. Mm -hmm. And so, so it is. In fact, one of the things that I love about the process or what I've learned about it is there's a book called The Impersonal Life by Joseph Benner. And that's one of my touchstones, okay? And it's also the voice of God, our inner self talking to us. And it said, your problem is you're trying to grow yourself. He said, you don't know who you are. I do. He said, I know you're me. And I know for you to fully become me is a process that you don't, you just want to get there. 
and a part of you is already there, that's the part of me that's in you right now. But the, the outer part of you has to go through a process through time and space to get there. I know who you are, and I know what it's going to take. And irrespective if you want to be there today, you ain't going to get there to, until you're ready. And I know what it takes. So relax. <laughs> Us relax. Daryl, she didn't relax. Sure, that's a concept. Okay? So I've been at this for a long time. All right? And you're right. It is a process. Okay? In fact, the Course in Miracles says this. In another part of the Course, it says... You can't let go, which is a necessary part of the surrender. Your ego is too plexed up to let go. And God would not ask of you what you cannot do. God only asks that you be willing to surrender. And if you're willing to surrender, God will take this and transform it into the gift. How <laughs> God did that to me, I think, is that I was willing to surrender. And the willingness to surrender meant... That I was willingness to go through adversity, undefined at the time, yeah. to learn my lesson. If they had told me what the lesson was going to be, I would have closed the window. Mr. Shun, uh, it's, it appears to be that your adversity is going to be a 10-year prison sentence. Oh, well, I'll do that in another lifetime. They didn't tell me that. They said, you're going to have to go through it. Sure, I want this. I'm willing to go. So I let go of all my affirmation, a thought again, mm -hmm. because the desk, when I read that one book in 1983, which we referred to before, it said you are using thought, which is creative and powerful, to keep away situations that you need to learn from, because much of your learning comes through adversity at this, at this time, not forever, only at this time, at this moment in your evolution of a being, you are learning through adversity. It didn't say you are going to suffer forever on your way here. It only says at this certain point, you learn through adversity. So quit trying to have the life that you want and let us at you. So he did. In, in other words, you with that moment in time weren't able to take that notion that and let go. adversity was required and sort of wish it away with an affirmation. Which I would have wanted to do. Uh -huh. Which you're right. I would have wanted I'm, to do that. I mean, you could have said, uh, like I sometimes say when I get a negative thought, I say, cancel that thought. Yes. It said there were parts of me that needed to go through this process. Yeah, and you bought that. I bought that. <laughs> I stopped all my affirmations again. At the moment, as I said before, Jeffrey, when I read those words, I was living in a $4,500 a month compound above the little village of, 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 of Mill Valley. And one of my friends pointed out, I probably had the largest food budget of anybody he knew because I got to eat, eat everywhere I wanted to eat and bring my friends with me. Mm -hmm. And it said, no, 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 not if you want to go forward. Yeah. So I let go of all my affirmations and goals. And a year and a half later, I get busted in this massive sentence, 10-year prison sentence, and when I got there, I threw the chain. I said, can I do affirmations? And it goes, yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you something. That was 1985. Only in the interim since I talked to you have I really consciously done affirmations again. In other words, in the last five months since you were here, here in Albuquerque with me. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now you're doing them again. Yes. From a different point of view. And what's that point of view? The point of view is, Unless I take control of my life as a creator God in my life to bring perfection into my localized universe and experience, it won't happen. And as, as, a, as a, the cost of doing so is to control my thoughts to such a degree that I only see God's power. That I do not give any credence or any acknowledgement of any error of the power that opposes the one unifying and creative thought in the universe and power in the universe. In other words, I have to go from the world of duality into the Nagual. I have to come at the, the Tonal from the Nagual. This reminds me in a sense of a metaphor of a, of my first vision that I believe that was extraordinary when I was in a solid geometry class and you were cones. Okay. I'm in solid geometry class, so I'm around 16 years old, and I'm crappy at math, all right? And we're looking at solid geometry, and we're studying cones. Cones are like, um, in, in two-dimensional geometry, uh, a cone is not a cone. It's like a, an angle. It's formed right. by the intersection of two lines yeah. with a certain angle, mm -hmm. all right? And the angle is like this. 
we're studying cones, and all of a sudden it comes to me that this is a this is reality. That that cone, we are the point at which lines meet, and they go out and they expand in both directions. Mm -hmm. There is a there's two cones. Two cones meet at a point. We're that point. Uh -huh. At one point, the expression of that cone is the tonal. I didn't know it then. Yeah. Now I'm using the, the diction. The world of the, manifestation. Of manifestation. The other cone is the nagual. The void. The void. And what I knew, and I didn't know why I knew it, but I knew that to make the outer cone get bigger and more expansive was done from the other cone. Only by the other cone was one able to extend because it, it's like this. So, well, being like this, by you made it big. Now, what I also ultimately thought about the metaphor was that if you keep pushing it, they, the lines disappear. They envelop each other. They envelop each other. And yeah. all you are is the point. That, was, that came to me at, at an early age mm -hmm. that I had no context of. Yeah. All right? Now, so... What has happened since I saw you is I now am doing, I'm using thought with an intention and a commitment that I have not done since 1983. Okay? When I stopped doing it, living the life of ease in Mill Valley and let go, and I got my 10 year prison sentence where I began a period of intense meditation and I achieved that sense of oneness. Temporarily. It's, it's fair to say you learned a lot since I learned 1983. Lot. Since 93. Part of getting it and yeah. part of letting it, of not being there. Mm. Because that period in time was for a period of time. Mm -hmm. My taste of the eternal was temporal. Yeah. Which made me go, why? I thought when you got there, you were always there, which is a thought of the temporal mind. <laughs> okay. I got there and then I came back here. Which happens to many people through near-death experiences, psychedelics, You're right. mystical experiences, uh, you know, getting a knock on the head. Yeah. It, it can happen for, for many reasons. Being and told that you're going to die in three weeks. It could lead to absolute fear or going over the edge. Of yeah. doing to the light. So, so temporary experiences of enlightenment, I think it's fair to say, are much more common than, than a stable state. You're right. Now, in my own line of, rea of reality, I had achieved that, I had gone to that state with the use of psychedelics. This was done without the use of drugs. I had shut down my mind with intense meditation because the caveat for each is no thinking. Yeah. As we're talking about, what is thought? Isn't that something? Yes. That the state of non-thought is what we call enlightenment, and we're talking about thought? Thought, let's get closer to the definition of our topic today. Thought seems to be that point at which the creative self pushes a reality in a manifestation. In the word, in the beginning, there was the word. The word is a thought. Out of the thought comes creation. Mm -hmm. We do that because of who we are. What's coming to me now as you're speaking is, is the idea that as the body can serve as a temple for the spirit, our thoughts can also serve as vehicles for spiritual energy. Thank you for that, Dr. Vinsla. I'll keep going in between Jeffrey and Doc. <laughs> as a sign of... of okay. You're right. And I love the fact that you brought the body back in. Because in the hierarchy of judgment about creation, spirit has always been at the top. Thought, awareness. Um, we're, it's thought. Keep your thoughts up there. What's below that and seem to be lesser than thought is emotions and feeling. Okay? To be called a rational person is seen as good. To be called an emotional person is seen as less than good. All right. To be called a person focused in the body is the worst of all, the lowest of all, the most depth in creation. And I've thought about that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you've brought it back into conversation gives me an opportunity to opine <laughs> on the body in the hierarchy that we've just laid out. It has come to me through my readings 
<laughs> not naturally through my, but my readings, I think, come to me for a reason. Okay. And they came to me through, in, a, in a very focused way through the same books that I read when I was in prison called Write You So Well. And that's where I learned about the importance of feeling, thought, and emotion. That they were not below awareness, spirituality, and omness. That they were just merely the other polarity of creation. The feminine is feeling, magnetic. The male polarity is, is awareness and electrical. But between these two polarities, creation is creative, comes in manifestation. And unlike the boys who saw it first from the spirit polarity, it's not better than the other polarity. Mm -hmm. Endemic in religious thought is the hierarchy that the spirit is better than the will, that awareness is better than feeling and emotion and the body. Why? Because these are historical reflections of an attempt to look at creation. You could call them cultural artifacts. Thank you. Yes. They are only, cult and they are cultural artifacts. Because there certainly are spiritual traditions like Tantra that turn it upside down. Yes, very good. Dr. Mishla, I'm feeling better. I should have just come to see you rather than gone through my 50 years of life. I should, after you came out of my restaurant, I should never have left your side. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't have to go through the crap that I went through. Well, yeah, okay. we're, we're old friends. Yeah, we are old friends. Yeah. Okay, now, this is what brought it into focus for me, the right use of will books. And what they, what God said is there five aspects of creation or four aspects, four major aspects, five aspects of creation. There's the mother aspect, there's the father aspect, and there, there's the son aspect, the result of the father and mother. There is the, uh, and then, the, no, the, the next aspect is the body aspect, creation. I ran into that concept in 1985, 86, 87, 80, through the use of reading Rice the Will. Then it was carried on even further through a, 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 a channeling of thought called GodChannel.com. No, oh, okay. What would be a better way for God to talk to us right now except to have its own website? The God Channel. GodChannel.com. <laughs> and this is where I found the continuation of much of the thought that had been presented in Right Use of Will. Mm -hmm. And here it is, is where the body is, no, is what, uh, you just reiterated what they said. That the body is an is a critical component to where we are now, to the expression of spirit, will, feeling, and love. It's not something to be discarded. Now, what right uses will said, as there are judgments against emotions and feeling, there are incredible judgments against the body. And I thought about why. And the reason I've come up with is that to in in the in the evolution of creation, we part of ourselves or some of us begin to identify with the body with the reason we're here which we don't enjoy. We, the spirit, finds itself in a reality that is not what it wants. Mm -hmm. It is trapped there. And why, why it thinks it's trapped there is the body. If, the bo if it weren't in the body, it would rise above and be in the state of, oh, my body, oh, the bliss. But it ain't in the bliss. It's in a sea of suffering in the body. Mm -hmm. And the body is the reason why it's suffering, because of those goddamn desires. <laughs> Desires, desires, suffering, suffering, suffering. Not so. At least according to the right use of will, which apparently is God in the way it sees things. All and right? the God channel. And the God channel <laughs> taught God. <laughs> yeah. All right. But because of our evolution as spirits, we have identified the problems being emotional. <laughs> All right. And some of the thoughts that we have that right the wrong use of thought, the okay, and emotional body and the physical body. According to <laughs> right use of will and God channel.com, the problem is from a temporary misalignment of these realities. The temporary misalignment is evolution. Okay? That creation is evolving. And we are a part of that creation. And we are an integral part to that creation, all right? As one of the things that I found when I read it in the 1960s, they were talking about the medicine wheel. This is native thought. Mm -hmm. That the, in, in the medicine wheel, which all beings are on, only man doesn't know his place on the medicine wheel. Only man 
is also a creator on the medicine wheel, which is an explanation of a big fuck up. <laughs> Us are the only beings on the medicine wheel that is a creator, and only us doesn't know our place on the medicine wheel. In other words, we're creating without any sense of our place in it. We are creating from a sense of dissociation, of alienation, and, uh, and not knowing. Everything else in the universe knows except us. And we don't know because of the foreign installation or of the fall. There are various stories or of the, of the, of the, of the emergence of thought. Okay, now, being the judgmental sort of that I am, I'm an Aquarian, I make judgments like this. My first thought about thought, one of the thoughts that emerged about thought was, thought is really bad, is dangerous. Okay, and that's what I said, and I call that about free will. That free will is a two-edged sword with no handle. All right? Very hard thing to deal with. Mm -hmm. And that, what that means is, as a part of the two it, the, 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 the dichotomy of free will, you have to learn how to, how to be thoughtful. One of the thought, the, and what, it just occurred to me, that what, that what we're calling, what I call thoughtful, is to be mindful. That in learning to handle the two-edged sword of free will, we are forced by our, our feedback from reality as creators that we better start becoming, maybe we should be mindful. Because if we're not mindful, life is not the way we want it to be. So what you're suggesting is being mindful is not the same as thinking. Yes, very good. That we all think, but only a few of us are mindful. Or we all think and only momentarily are we mindful. All right. And what you're saying, I'm going to take again in my own life is what I've had, what has happened between me and when I was here the last time is the necessity to be mindful. And as a part of the necessity of being mindful is the conscious use of thought in a particular way or of affirmation mm -hmm. in a particularly defined and constrained and yet expansive way. That unless I constrain the process, the process will lead to my own continued dissatisfaction and suffering. But if I can constrain and direct and commit to the process as a part of God, creating perfection in my localized universe, we will be back in what God calls, um, for want of a better term, the Garden of Eden. Thank you, Dr. Mishla. Like I said, I should never have let you go out of my restaurant out of my sight <laughs> in 1971. <laughs> well, uh, this has been a delightful conversation, Daryl. I think what you're getting at now is, is that just mindfulness is, is like a higher application of affirmations. Uh, I see what you're saying is what, what I sometimes might call uh, meta-thinking. It's like uh, I, Gurdjieff also used a term about being aware of yourself. Yes. Not just thinking and going from thought to thought to thought, but stepping back and watching yourself do it. Now, the self. Seeing yourself through God's eyes. Something came to me. In fact, it's really funny. I, was, I Googled myself and one of my quotes was there on Reddit. And this is what it was. Um, well, let me see if I can get it. I'm not sure if I can bring it back. But the thought was this. By examining the affairs of man and self-interest, you will discover the reasons why we as individuals act and why, basically, I'm, I'm summarizing this up, in the actions of individual men and nations through self-interest. But by discovering further the nature of the self involved, you will discover the difference between the self that you serve is creating, what it's creating out there. Well, that's a very good lead in to uh, some of the interviews that we have planned uh, for later while you're here in Albuquerque because we've been talking about the self. We've been talking about personal consciousness. We're going to look at uh, larger issues that we've explored previously, issues about money, issues about conspiracies even. Uh, but it's good that we have this framework. Dr. Jeffrey Mishlove, I want to end this by bowing to yourself.
Namaste. I honor the self within you, the God within you as well. Daryl Shoon, thank you for being with me. Thank you, Dr. Mistler. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Thank you.